Good morning. Good to see all of you here today. Um, appreciate what uh, Colin had to say there. Just um, uh, It has been, I think, a difficult week, and, and that song, I think, just kind of is, uh, is part of that. Pastor Cora was actually going to preach this morning, but um, it, Steve basically just gave him a mandatory vacation. Uh, he doesn't play the, the pastor, uh, you know, senior pastor card too often, but he, but he did that. And, um, and then he did it on me saying, you're, you're preaching, so, um, <laughs> which is okay. <laughs> you know, again, I, it's a privilege and an honor, and, and, uh, and I was already going to preach tonight anyways at Lower Town and in St. Paul. And so, those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian. I'm on the pastoral staff here, although several of you have called me Jesus this morning, um, which uh, I think I'm a little too white for that. But, uh, and uh, Phil, Phil Wise, if you don't know him, he works with our youth, and we were in a staff meeting the other day, and, and he said, you should tell Steve that if however many inches he cuts off his beard, you should trim your, your hair up. And I was like, that's not a bad idea, actually. <laughs> Might take him up on that. Um, I really don't really try to grow my hair out or grow a beard. I'm just lazy, to be honest with you. And, and so I, I just kind of let it do its thing, and, and that's that. So um, anyways, we're at, we're at the big 30 today. This is, this is week number 30 that we've been in the book of Exodus, uh, which seems like a long time, and, and, it, and realistically it is. I mean, it's 52 weeks in a year, and 30 of them we have covered this book, and it's been a great journey, uh, and one for me that to be able to, to just really dig into this book in a way that I've never done before has been a lot of fun for me, um, and looking at how everything, as we're going to see today, points, points to Jesus. So if you haven't been here, there's, there's obviously 30 weeks worth of material that I'm not going to be able to catch you up on, but, but last week, uh, we, we covered, uh, at least I did, I think Cor uh, named it differently, at least the, the title of it was The Way to Holiness, and looking at what was in the tabernacle and what were the elements in it, and so we have this, uh, this image of what the tabernacle would have looked like, and just what, what Colin said, just the, the detail and the specificity of, of what is going on in it and what's the reason behind all these things. And so I literally have in my notes here just all the stuff, right? All the stuff inside of this. You get the Ark of the Covenant there in the Holy of Holies and uh, made out of just pure gold and, and or at least wood overlaid inside and out of gold and, and the skill and craftsmanship that goes into that. You've got that veil there um, in front of the altar of incense, which we were introduced to last week. And then the menorah and the table of showbread there, and, uh, and then outside in the, in the court there. And so that's what we've been looking at, and just the, the detail of it. And, and it, it's, it's in the picture here too, but there's four layers just to the tent, right? And so the, 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 the time and effort and resources that go into it, two of the layers you don't ever see, right? They're just, they're just not ever seen. And the Ark of the Covenant, someone spent a lot of time working on this thing, and nobody ever saw it except the high priest once a year, right? Just the immense detail and work that goes into what happens here. And so this is God's dwelling space, his place that he's saying, this is what my space looks like. And so for me to dwell there with you, this is also what it will look like. And so he gives them the directions uh, with that. So uh, moving on to where we're going to be at today. Um, yesterday, I finished this playground uh, play set and it took me a long time. The, 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 the reason why the backyard looks like a forest is because it is. Um, <laughs> someone purchased uh, this for my, my son, and uh, it came in boxes. Nothing was assembled. Um, so there's nothing prefab. All the lattice work, all the, like, that was just a, a mess of, of sticks and wood. Um, and I'm thinking about writing a review of if there's anybody who's thinking about buying this who's, who's bigger than me, don't, right? Because you got to crawl under there and get, get underneath it, you know, to put the hinge on the door and all these, right? And then you got to climb back on top and it's just back and forth, up and down, going up and down this thing. And, and then, you know, sometimes there's like this little sunburst thing. Why? I don't know, right? It's like no kids care about a wooden sunburst on the side of this. And, and so you spend the time, right, like 80 screws putting this thing together. You finally install it. You turn the page, and it's like, go back and repeat the last page of steps, right? It's like, no, we've got to do two of these things, right? And just this meticulous detail of what's going to happen. So yesterday I finished it. It was really cool because Henry, my son, hadn't come down to that side of the yard because uh, it was uninhabitable. And uh, so we, we just, I just scraped the top layer of weeds away, and then we'll fix it uh, next year. Um, but... <laughs> So he, he comes walking down, and he just right the joy on his face, and he didn't even care about the slide. He just, all he wants to do is swing. It's all he wants to do. So I probably, we could have just put a little swing set together, no problem. <laughs> Anyways, 
Uh, he comes down, he's overjoyed seeing this thing, and I went through 55 steps, right, it was to put this whole thing together, and, and it took me, I don't, I don't want to know how many hours, and just every spare minute I had, I'd go out there and put one more thing together, and, and um, I did every step, I, I did all the steps except the very last one, right, so I made it to the finish line, 54 steps, and there was this one thing, and I was like, that's stupid, like, I'm just done, I'm fed up, Henry's already on the swing, it's fine. Well, then I decide to get on the swing next to him, and as I'm swinging with him, I realize that last step was actually very practical and important, right? Um, And it was stake it to the ground, right? Because because if you swing too hard, uh, it will it will go with you. And so, uh, thankfully, my son was safe. I was safe. No, you know, disaster averted. And and realized, oh, I need to finish it, right? I need to go back and do this this detailed work. Of, of finishing this, and, and, and that kind of is where we're at. And so we're going to look at these practical but important laws. And now listen, every single week, uh, as a staff, we, we gather over next door and we pray. We pray we pray for you as a church as a whole. We pray for those individuals who just wanted to hit the snooze button, uh, right? Those of you that it's just difficult on a Sunday morning to get out of bed and go to church. And I guarantee that those of you that, that maybe that was you, you're struggling, man, uh, just, man, I just... I went last week, you know, like, give me a break, right? That if, if someone would have called you and told you that the sermon title is going to be practical, practical but important laws, right? I mean, all right, I mean, how many of you would just, I'm going to stay in bed today, right? I just, I'm not sure I'm going to come in. I, I felt that way this morning, um, and uh, <laughs> knowing, knowing what was at hand. But, but it's really, really exciting. And, and they are practical, and they are incredibly important, at least for Israel, and as we're going to see, because if they don't obey them, they're going to die. So they are important, right? But what does it mean for us? What can we get out of this text? And I'm, and I'm actually really excited about where, where we're going to be going today. Um, so this is going to be Exodus 30, 11 through 31, 18. I will read it all. I couldn't even get close to fitting it all on your thing. It's not a lot of text. It's really just you know, a little more of a chapter, but... Um, uh, the verses aren't long, so we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. So, Exodus, chapter 30. First point, death and taxes, right? What's the, the phrase is uh, death and taxes, right? Nothing's as certain as death and taxes, right? Something like that. Um, right, and that's what happens here. All the way back in Exodus, chapter 30, we have God, okay, so again, context. God is speaking to Moses, giving these important laws and detailed work of what's going to happen. At the end of the chapter, Moses is going to go come down the mountain, and he's going to start talking to his people. That'll be, that'll be next week. All right, so God is talking to Moses. He says this. Then Yahweh said to Moses, when you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay Yahweh a ransom for his life the time he is counted. Uh, then no plague will come on them when you number them. All right, um, some of you may be thinking, uh, at least uh, I know that uh, my, my Google click did, uh, reminded me of King David when he takes a census and he actually gets punished and a plague comes on the people for the census because he wanted to build his army. How many people did he have? How could he expand his empire? And that's not what the point of this census was to be. All right, it says this, each one who crosses over those already counted to give is to give half a shekel according to sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 geras. Uh, this half shekel is an offering to Yahweh. All who cross over, those 20 years old or more, are to give an offering to Yahweh. The rich are not to give more than a half a shekel, and the poor are not to give less uh, than when you make an offering to Yahweh to atone for your lives. All right, uh, receive the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the service of the tent of meeting, okay? Uh, again, the Levites, the, the, those people who were in charge of the priesthood didn't have paying jobs, if you will, right? They, they couldn't just go out and, and grow some corn and then sell it to their neighbor. Uh, they, they couldn't do that. They had no way of earning money and earning their keep and their say. So they're saying they're, you're gonna kind of give a, a tax, you're gonna give something, right, too, and, and, and it's an atonement for your lives, right? literally death and taxes, right, when it comes to, comes to Yahweh. And so he's saying you're gonna give all this stuff to the Levites so they can purchase the things for the tent, for sheep, for whatever it may be, and that's what the census was for. There was some joke in here I was gonna say with Jack Black, or uh, Jack Black, meet Joe Black, uh, he plays death. I don't remember. I didn't write it down. So there's a picture of uh, Brad Pitt for you this morning. <laughs> so <laughs> I know there is something where he said death and taxes, but I, that was, that's all. That's all I got for you. All right. 
Moving on here, there's a basin for washing. So we're going to be introduced to a new instrument, but it's not going to be on the inside of the tabernacle. It's going to be outside of the tabernacle. So therefore, it's going to be made of, of bronze, uh, not gold and not silver. Then Yahweh said to Moses, make a bronze basin with the bronze stand uh, for washing. Um, place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. So further away is the altar, which is outside where they would uh, burn and have the sacrifices. So this is in between the tabernacle and the altar. Um, and Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and their feet with water from it. And whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash uh, with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister, uh, presenting a food offering to Yahweh, they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Okay, so this basin, uh, just kind of this, this picture here, it's hard to see, but it's in between there, the tabernacle and the altar in the courtyard there. And that's where they would, they would wash, right? Now, again, science wasn't what it is today. They didn't have, you know, clean soap. It wasn't necessarily for sanitary purposes. I think it would have done that, uh, they would have been covered in blood a lot of times, and so just to rinse off the blood would have been very uh, helpful, I would imagine. But it was more ceremonial. So I've got a quote here from uh, Peter N. says this, This washing likely has practical as well as ceremonial function. The slaughter that takes place at the altar will certainly leave the priests bloody, and washing the blood off of them will make them more presentable. But again, this explanation is a conjecture and finds no explicit basis in the text, right? It, we, don't, we don't know. Are they washing for cleanliness? Text just doesn't tell us, right? But the washing may also symbolize uh, the cleansing from sin. And there are times where symbolically they would do that. And even when Jesus was around, when they would wash their hands, they would just literally just pour water over their hand and, and do it with one hand, and they would let it drip down, right? It wasn't necessarily for, for cleaning. It was ceremonial and what it represented. Uh, moving on here, uh, the anointing oil. Then Yahweh said to Moses, take the following fine spices, 50 shekels of liquid myrrh, as much, a half as much as that. That is 250 shekels. Thanks, Moses. We can't divide by two. Um, <laughs> of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of fragrant calamus, 50, 500 shekels of uh, cassia. All of, these are all just kind of different spices, I guess, uh, so I'm, I'm told. All according to the sanctuary shekel. And a hen of olive oil. Okay, what is all that? Basically, it's 16 pounds, uh, so the commentaries say, of spices and one gallon of olive oil. Uh, make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, uh, the work of a perfumer. Uh, it will be a sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant, the law, the table, and all its articles, the lampstand, its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offerings, and all of its utensils, and the basin with its stand, and you shall consecrate them, uh, and they will be most holy, and who, whatever touches them will be holy. All right, so they're going to take this oil somehow and anoint. I don't know if they just cover it or just, you know, touch it with the oil, but it, it makes it holy. It sets it apart to God. It's been anointed by this, by this fragrance that, and this oil that God has given them. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, all right, to serve me as priests. So uh, say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on anyone else's body and do not make any other oil using the same formula. Okay, so this, this ingredient list that, that he just gives and how to make it, it's sacred. Nope, don't be doing this for your own cooking class, right? This is, this is important and it's set aside for what's happening in the tabernacle. He says, whoever makes perfume like it and puts it on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from their people, right? Cast out, exile. This is very strong language. Uh, this last time we heard this language was the Passover meal, that if they didn't uh, do the Passover, that they would be cut off, they'd be cast out from among their people. All right. Moving on here, incense. You doing okay? All right, I know there's a lot here, uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep going. Practical but important laws. And trust me, there's, this, is, this is fun. I just I'll hang tight, we're almost there. All right, uh, this is good too though. Okay, incense. Um, this would have been what would have been burned on the, the incense uh, burning table, <laughs> altar of incense, uh, right outside the Ark of the Covenant on the other side of the veil. Then Yahweh said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum resin, a uh, word and a word, <laughs> and pure frankincense, in all equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, uh, the work of a perfumer. It is to be salted and pure and sacred, grind some of it into powder and place it in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Law in the Tent of Meeting, where I will meet with you, and it will be most holy to you. Do not make any other incense with this formula or for yourselves. Consider it holy to Yahweh, set apart for God. And whoever makes incense like it, to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from the people. Again, same thing, same language, harsh, strong language. You make this because it smells good, 
just because you want your house to smell that way, you're gonna be cut off, you're gonna be kicked out of, of Israel. All right, Sabbath. This is something we've, we've heard before, but he's gonna kind of talk about the consequences if they don't rest, all right? Sabbath, literally in Hebrew, just means stoppage, all right? That, that he commands them to stop, just stop, rest, wait, uh, which I did not do yesterday. I was outside working on that place that all day. All right, then Yahweh said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come so that you may know that I am Yahweh who makes you holy. There's something about stopping the way that God stopped in his creation order that sets them apart, that makes them a special people group that says we want to be like our creator and we go back to the creation story to remember that. Verse 14, observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you and anyone who uh, desecrates it is to be put to death and those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people, all right? In the New Testament, we have the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and those individuals enacted what was called the Mishnah and the Talmud. What the Pharisees wanted is they wanted all Israelites to obey the Levitical priesthood laws, all right? So these laws that are going out to the Levites, the priests, they're saying, hey, we're under occupation of the Roman government, and we want them out, and the only way to get them out is to be really holy. Be God's people, be separate. So they, they wrote these extra biblical teachings, the Mishnah and the Talmud, to, to teach people on how to live. And the laws that they wrote in there, you think these are detailed. Those were incredibly detailed. What does it mean don't work, right? Like any work, what does that, what does that mean? To them, it meant if I spit and it hits dirt and the dirt moves, I've worked and I'm cut off, right? It, they were incredibly detailed and, 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 and religious about what these laws meant, all right? So they took these very seriously. Why? For six days, work is to be done, but on the seventh day, it is to be a stoppage rest, holy to Yahweh. And whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death, right? This is not a small thing. And the Pharisees are saying, man, this is happening because we didn't obey these laws. The Israelites are to observe, observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. In six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. That's kind of an interesting translation, but he rested, right? He didn't, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't like tired. I'm exhausted. God doesn't get tired. It's not what, what this text is saying, right? But what this does, what this Sabbath, what we just learned, it adds a consequence that we don't see other places, right? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's in the Big Ten, right? But here he says, but if you don't do that, if you do work, you're gonna die, like you'll be killed for this. So these are incredibly important to them. Okay, now I wanna uh, kind of, so what? What are we getting at? All right, if, you, if you're following along, you're reading your Bible, I actually skipped a portion, right? I wasn't trying to like trick you or anything like that. Uh, I'm gonna get to it because I think that that portion that I, that I passed has some very practical application and gospel application for us today. All right, so, uh, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, more, more rules, okay. Um, I'm a fan of the Jesus Storybook Bible. If you're a, you're a parent and you're, you're reading to your children, um, which would, you should do that, parents. I'm not trying to shame you, but, but, but read to your kids. Um, the Jesus Storybook Bible is, is phenomenal. Um, and, and what I love about it is it's written by Sally Lloyd-Jones, and, and she just does an incredible job of taking a story and saying it all points to Jesus. Everything in the Bible points to to Jesus, even these seemingly insignificant laws that have nothing to do with us now under the new covenant, what does this mean? How does that point to Jesus, right? And her tagline is every story, I can't read it, every story whispers his name, right? Everything points to Jesus, right? And I love it. She uses this analogy. She says that, that growing up, if, if you grew up in the church, and I know not everyone did, but even outside of the church, you may have heard stories or you may know the story of Noah's Ark, right? Or you may know the story of David and Goliath. You may have heard of Jesus and his crucifixion, whatever. She said, we, we tend to kind of compartmentalize them, right? That we just view that as that story, and that one as that story, and that one as that story. She says, like, kind of like pearls. You look at them as individual pearls, but we don't realize that they are all incredibly connected to make one beautiful necklace, and that just points to Jesus every single thing about it. So I want to go, go back, 
right? Jesus, or excuse me, God goes, goes back to the creation story uh, when he talks about Sabbath, so I wanna go back to the beginning as well. Genesis 1, right, so all the way back in the beginning. This is the creation account of God creating uh, Adam and Eve, man and woman, and he says this, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them, right? This image of God, what does that mean? There's a lot of things that can mean, a lot of implications of what it means to be an image bearer of God. But I love what uh, one commentary says. John Walden says this. In the ancient world, an image was believed in some ways to carry the essence of that which it represented. All right, so this idol, this thing that they would make carried the essence of the deity. Right? An, an idol image of a deity designated by the same terminology used here. That is in Genesis 1, right? This image bearing, they would use the, the exact same way, was used in worship because it contained the deity's essence, right? This idol contains the deity's essence. This does not suggest the image could do what the deity did, or it even looked the same as the deity, even though the idol was a physical object. Rather, the deity's work was thought to be accomplished through the idol. So this is why in the right, Ten Commandments, when God says, you shall not make any graven image, you're not gonna make idols of me. Why? Because you're my image. You are my image. You are going to accomplish my work, and you are going to reflect who I am in you. So be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with other image bearers of me. I want to uh, read a little bit from C.S. Lewis. He does an incredible uh, job of, I think, taking this idea of image bearing and puts it in story form. Uh, the last I read this, I, I read this at Lower Town back when we were doing the Reformation series, if you remember that. So it was actually a year ago and, and, and I, that, I, that I read this. So uh, I'm going to read it here, though, um, because I think it, it, there's some really, really neat things that C.S. Lewis does. So this is from uh, The Magician's Nephew, which is the um, sixth in chronological order, but it's the first uh, in, uh, nope, sorry, first chronologically, but it was written sixth out of seven books. Not that that matters, okay? But this is the prequel, all right? The Magician's Nephew. Let me, let me read for you. Um, this is uh, kind of his creation story in the Chronicles what? of Narnia. All right. <laughs> nephew. All right, and now, for the first time, the lion, Aslan, all right? The lion was quite silent, and he was going to and fro among the animals. And every now and then he would go up to two of them, always two at a time, and touch their noses with his. He would touch two beavers among all the beavers, two leopards among all the leopards, one stag and one deer among all the deer, and leave the rest. Some sorts of animals he passed over altogether. But the pairs which he had touched instantly left their own kinds and followed him. At last he stood still, and all the creatures whom he had touched came and stood in a wide circle around him, and the others whom he had not touched began to wander away. Their, no their, their, no their noises faded gradually into the distance. The chosen beasts who remained were now utterly silent, all with their eyes fixed intently upon the lion. The cat-like ones gave an occasional twitch of the tail, but otherwise all were still. For the first time that day, there was complete silence, except for the noise of the running water. Diggory, the child in the story that has made it to Narnia, his heart beat wildly. He knew that something very solemn was going to be done. The lion, whose eyes peered at the animals as, as hard as if he was going to burn them up with a mere stare, and gradually, a change came over them. The smaller ones, the rabbits, moles, and such like, grew a good deal larger. The very big ones, you notice that most of the elephants, grew a little smaller. Many animals sat up on their hind legs. Most put their heads on one side as if they were trying to, hard to understand. 
The lion opened his mouth, but no sound came from it. He was breathing out a long, warm breath. It seemed to sway all the beasts as the wind sways the line of trees. Then the wildest voice they had ever heard was saying, Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak, be walking trees, be talking beasts. It was, of course, the lion's voice, and the children had long felt sure that he could speak, yet it was a lovely and terrible shock once he did. Out of the trees, wild people stepped forth, gods and goddesses of the wood, and with them came the fawns and the satyrs and the dwarfs, and out of the river rose a river god and his naiad daughters, and all these and the beasts, the birds, had their different voices, low or high or thick or clear, replied, Hail Aslan, we hear and obey, we are awake, we love, we think, we speak, we know. Creatures, I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give it, I give to you forever this land of Narnia, and I give you the woods and the fruits and the rivers. I give you the stars, and I give you myself. The dumb beasts whom I have not chosen are also yours. Treat them gently and cherish them, but do not, do not go back to their ways lest you cease to be talking beasts. For out of them you were taken, and into them you can return. Do not do so. No, Aslan, we won't, we won't, said everyone. Don't return to being animalistic. There's something about Jesus who is the truly human one. And when we live like Christ, we become more human. And when we choose the sin, when we choose the suffer, when we choose to reject that King of kings and Lord of lords and do it our own way, we become more beastly. We become like the animals. And one thing that I love about this is that when, when Aslan and, and God in the creation story breathes that breath of life on them, they're created in their image and there's something about them. Every single human being who's ever walked the face of the earth that reflects and images their creator. Every single one of them. So now I want to go back to the, the chunk that I skipped in Exodus we're going to see that God gives this skill to certain individuals. So chapter 31, the start of it, verse 1. Then Yahweh said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezael, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skills. What kind of skills? to make artistic designs. Right? He gives them the ability to, to create art and work in gold and silver and bronze and to cut and set stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Ohaliab, son of Eshemhak, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given the ability to all the skilled workers to make everything that I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant of Law, with the atonement cover on it, and all the other furnishings of the tent, and the table, and all of its articles, the pure gold lampstand, and all of its accessories, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offerings, and all of its utensils, and the basins with its stand, and also with woven garments, both sacred garments for Aaron the priest, and garments for his sons, which they are to serve as priests. And they're in the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense for the holy place, and they are to make them just as I commanded you. And what we see in this passage is, is God giving somebody, right, someone that's created in his image a specific skill, specifically art, and beautiful art. And I was reminded of a, a paper I, I read uh, recently. The author says this, beauty is the display of God himself. Beauty is the thing that draws us to worship. The beauty and lace throughout the world is the very thing that the Apostle Paul argues in Romans 1.20 is what gives man no excuse for not recognizing God as the creator of all of it. And if the beauty around us is not enough proof that the God of the universe desires such things, we can look into the Bible to see how he commands beauty to be present in the life and worship of his children. 
This, some of you may know this individual, is, was uh, written by Stephanie Kruger, uh, one of our interns last year. Uh, in her, one of her LDI papers, she, she wrote this. And, and it, was a, it was a beautiful paper. Right? And as I was reading and studying, I was reminded of this paper of saying that she, she talked about these individuals that were given the gift to create beauty. And, there's, and it's all over the place in the Old Testament of how God creates human beings and they are to flourish and multiply. And they write songs and hymns and spiritual songs. They create art and structures and buildings and, and life and families. It's beautiful. She goes on to say, in Exodus 31, a craftsman, Zael, is chosen by God to be the main craftsman that is to build the ark for the, of the covenant along with the tabernacle and everything in it. From Exodus 35 to Exodus 39 are filled with a description of the great detail that went into the making of these sacred places. Lavish designs, colors, materials were used in every aspect of their design. God was to dwell with his people through the tabernacle, but God, once again, in his desire to be surrounded by that which is beautiful, entrusted a human to create a beautiful place worthy of the dwelling of God. Nothing less than extravagant beauty could be enough to hold the almighty and all-powerful God that had led the Israelites out of Egypt. As she goes through her paper, it's, it's quite interesting. It, it, she talks about all the places in the Old Testament that demonstrate the beauty of God and it does demonstrate any kind of beauty, not just of God. And it's just filled. The Old Testament is just loaded with references to beauty. But in the New Testament, something changes. We just don't get the poetry. We don't get the singing. We don't get the art the way that we see in the Old Testament. But we do get a glimpse. We get a glimpse of Christ and what he represents. We get a glimpse of the creator. Matthew chapter 26 says this. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head, right? This anointing, distinguishing Christ. She anoints his head as they are reclining at the table. And when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Jesus is gonna die in two days. Truly I tell you, Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her, right? Like we're doing that right now. Like, yeah, Jesus is right. Yeah, imagine that, right? It's kind of cool, right? She does this beautiful thing, this extravagant, beautiful thing that she does to Jesus. And we see that beauty on display there. One last reading from Stephanie's paper. It says, to the disciple, the act of the woman was wasteful, but Jesus saw no waste, only beauty. This beauty didn't come through the form of a song or art, but through extravagant sacrifice. This is the overwhelming theme of beauty that appears in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God describes tangible beauty uh, from his people so that they can be surrounded by constant reflections of their God. But in the New Testament, God no longer commands such things. People no longer needed art forms to serve as reminders of God because God himself had taken on flesh and, and bones and walked among his people in real time. The embodiment of beauty for a time walked amongst humanity and displayed the purest form of beauty possible at Calvary, extravagant sacrifice. And as we look at these pearls of truth that we see all throughout scripture, I want you to get that, that image of the necklace, to say these seemingly insignificant things of just, okay, you gave a guy some talent. It's all connected, and it all points to Jesus and his beautiful sacrifice that he makes. So I want to see this beauty embodied. Matthew 26, it's the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be crucified in just a few hours. He's praying to the Father, and he says, and he went away a second time, and he prayed, my Father... If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. God, I don't want to die this way. 
Remove this cup if it's possible. Extravagant sacrifice. May your will be done. And what's beautiful, what we see the creator do in this moment for us, the creator of the universe who says, I want you to reflect my image, takes on that fleshly image and dies for his image bearers. Romans chapter 3 uses the language that, we, that he is, God, is both just and justifier. That he does something incredibly magnificent and beautiful on that cross that wasn't just some seemingly insignificant thing. He takes on flesh for you and for me, his image bearers that he created. It's beautiful. Looking at Ephesians 5, we again see what Christ is doing it says, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church, this body, and gave himself up for her to make her holy. He gave himself up for her. He set his preference aside for us to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. That he has taken us broken destitute, sinful human beings, and he has made us beautiful. He has washed us with his blood and cleansed us from our sin. It's beautiful. He goes on to this, verse 31, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ in the church. Husbands, wives, we set our preferences aside for one another because we love each other, but because we then reflect who Christ is. We image Christ when we love our spouses. We image Christ when we love anybody. We image Christ when we set our preference aside for fellow man. I love the, uh, the story. What, what I, what, here's what I love. This is what I love about Hope Community Church. I love that every single week, that a pastor gets up here and preaches, you know what you're told and reminded of every week? Jesus and the gospel story because it is beautiful. And I was reminded of, of this old hymn that we used to sing, tell me the old, old story. Right, remind me of it. And the, and the, and the second uh, uh, stanza goes like this, tell me the story slowly that I may take it in. It doesn't rhyme. Uh, it's actually pretty, pretty bad poetry, but um, you, get, you get the point. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon. And to quote Martin Luther, and I say this all the time at Lordtown, I need to continually beat the gospel of Jesus Christ into my head because I forget it. We just sang it, prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. So in gospel application, how are you imaging the creator? I don't know if imaging is a word. Angela said don't use it, my wife, but I'm, I use it anyways. <laughs> How are you imaging the creator? How is it that you're reflecting God, the Father, and Jesus Christ and saying, I'm gonna live this way, I'm gonna act this way, these laws and these things, and to live like a Christian and to set my preference aside to give him the honor, to give him the praise and him the glory because it's worth it. How are you doing that? I'm not an artist. I'm not. <laughs> but what I try to do, I try to do to the best of my ability. Why? Because it, that's what I've been created to do. I've been created to do things beautifully and in a, in a beautiful way, and so do you. You're a financial analyst, right? Do it to the best of your ability and image the creator in your work. How are you doing that? And finally, you are imaging the creator. I think it was perfect what Colin said about that music and, and, and the madness that, that goes on around us. We don't even understand what can be happening that I think sometimes we need to sit down and we just need to remember the beautiful story that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for you and that you are, you are imaging the creator. And not just you, but that person that you can't stand, <laughs> your boss, your neighbor, your niece, nephew. Huh? They have been made in the image of the creator. 
And so let's share with them this beautiful story so they can be transformed and they can become more human as well. Will you bow and pray with me? Help me, Father God. You are good. You are beauty. And you make that evident when you wrote the most beautiful story that's beyond our own comprehension. But you didn't just write it. You wrote yourself into it. That you took on flesh. That you became like us so that you could set us free. So that you could be just and demand perfection and holiness and at the same time be the justifier and set me free from the bondage of my sin, and slavery, and death. So God, I pray that as we sing a beautiful artistic song with our voices, and some of us may not have the most beautiful voices, but I pray that that would be a sweet-smelling savor to you, that you would just bask in glory in your creation, glorifying you. Because God, we love you and we thank you for that story that old, old story. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.